Thank you, John, and, and my thanks to the Heritage Foundation for inviting me. Uh, if I cough, I've just got this ticklish thing going on, so I apologize ahead of schedule. Um, okay, so, so why a book about media bias? I mean, there's an earth-shattering topic. When, when, when Steve Forbes came to me about 2010, uh, we were chatting, and he asked me, how bad were the media in 2008, really? And uh, I said, 100% in the tank for Barack Obama. And he said, well, how is it going to be in 2012? And I said, worse. And he laughed, and he said, how could that be? And I said, well, in 2008, they didn't care about John McCain. In 2012, they will not only be 100% in the tank for Barack Obama, but they will be 100% committed to the defeat of any Republican challenging Barack Obama. So move forward to the end of the 2012 campaign. And I get a call from an editor at HarperCollins recommending that I do a book about the 2012 elections um, and suggesting a title, Collusion, How the Media Stole the 2012 Elections. I have to confess I was cool to the idea at first. One, because I didn't think this was an earth-shattering topic that we didn't know about already. But secondly, because I don't, I don't get into hyperbole and collusion stealing elections. Um, it's just not my cup of tea. My colleague, Tim Graham, thought otherwise. He thought maybe there's more to the story than we see based on our day-to-day -day analysis of it. So uh, he went off for about two months with all the research compiled from 2012 and some additional research that he did gather from other sources. He came back and we looked at it. I called the editor and I said, I'll do the book and we'll call it just what you wanted us to call it because I can defend it. What we saw in 2012 was beyond what I thought we were going to see. It was beyond it in the sense that it was shameless. There was no attempt whatsoever by the national quote unquote news media to report news in 2012. From the beginning of the campaign past the end of the campaign, what the media served to do was advance the reelection of Barack Obama the man with whom they had, for whom they had invested so much of their time and efforts in 2008 and were so committed to his success. We saw where the politics of commission were concerned. As every Republican came forward as a viable challenger to Barack Obama, he or she was chopped at the knees, not on policy, not on politics, but on personal issues, every single one. Just go back and think about it. The first one out of the box, before she even came out of the box, Sarah Palin. What do we have about Sarah Palin? We had a reporter who took a house next to her vacation house to spy on her, who came out with a book suggesting she does cocaine, suggesting she had sex with basketball players or something. No evidence whatsoever, just gossip and presented to it. She came out with her book. Now folks, those of you who know anything about the book publishing business know that it's a great honor if you have somebody vet your book. It's not so much of an honor if two people are vetting your book or three people. AP had nine people reportedly vetting Sarah Palin's book, looking for anything they could find to hit her on. But her critic's book? Nobody had anything to say about him. Michelle Bachman, she is the first one out of the box as a declared candidate. You saw the attacks on her. She was painted as a Christian zealot. Remember the Time Magazine cover on her? I mean, she looked like the devil incarnate. If, if, if the devil were female, that would be Michelle Bachman. All the stories about her husband's ministry back in Minnesota and tying her to it as if something was wrong because Somebody might believe that a homosexual might become a non-homosexual, that that was an earth-shattering development that required national attention. Well, she was done with, in very short order, Herman Cain. Herman Cain comes along. Now, he could have been covered as a sensation, as a Tea Party sensation, as was Michelle Bachman. Instead, what did we learn about Herman Cain? We learned allegations 
of marital infidelity. Interesting. In journalism, there is a rule that is sacrosanct. If you don't have two sources, you don't have a story. Until you have two sources, you don't report a story. Think about this. There were, I believe it was, 78 national network stories on Herman Cain's alleged infidelities without a single source. There were over 110 stories, I believe it was in two weeks, which is beyond an avalanche of coverage on Herman Cain. That's what America got to know about Herman Cain, Rick Perry. Never mind that as a governor, he has arguably the single greatest, most successful track record of any governor in America today. He was an idiot. He was a doofus. Two plus two was a challenge for this man. And then there was that rock. We all know about that rock, don't we? That rock with the N-word on the ranch in 1982 when his parents were on vacation. The one that they painted over because they found offensive. National news story, stop the presses. Rick Perry, Texan, a mm, little bit of racism going on there. He's done with Newt Gingrich. Newt Gingrich comes along, and boom, we have a breaking explosive story. His former wife doesn't like him, and she's given an interview to a network to say it. Now, there's a stop the presses story for you. Mitt Romney. Last one, Rick Santorum. Rick Santorum. Ladies and gentlemen, think about this. Did we need to know who Karen Santorum was dating before she ever met Rick Santorum? More importantly, did their children deserve to hear these stories? Did it have any bearing on a presidential race other than to smear Rick and Karen Santorum. Mitt Romney. Mitt Romney comes along. This is a delicious apples to apples comparison. Mitt Romney has a 5,400 word essay devoted to him in the Washington Post. In that essay, we learn, again, stop the presses here, that when he was what? 16, 15, he cut some boy's hair. Oh, yes, he did. <laughs> and we learn at the very same day that Barack Obama switched his position on gay rights. The boy allegedly was a homosexual. Aha! The story is not Barack Obama switching his position. The point is that we have to cover Mitt Romney was a homophobe. Now, never mind. This, this man is now dead, is, is deceased. His parents, his family, said that story was false. This boy's family disputed that story. But 5,400 words devoted to it. That's what we needed to know about Mitt Romney's youth. Shortly thereafter, same newspaper, 5,500 words on Barack Obama's youth. And what did we learn there? We learned he loved basketball. Barack Obama loved basketball. That's the theory. I mean, that's the signature. That's the takeaway from his youth. This is a newspaper that would love to do muckraking, but they can't because all you know is that he loved basketball. Barack Obama loved something else in high school. He wrote about it in his own book. He loved to do pot. He was a pothead in high school. He was a member of the Chum Gang. He writes all about it. How in the world writing a 5,500 word essay on Barack Obama's high school years, could you omit that? If that isn't biased by omission, I don't know what it is. Now, is this cataclysmic? Is this something that caused the election in 2012? No, but it was the daily grind of coverage in 2012. It went all the way up to and through the debates. Candy Crowley, what Candy Crowley did, 